Good day, Neil. First of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me. I'd like to read an introduction for our viewing audience. Neil, you are known throughout the world as a speaker, writer, and seminal thinker on sales and marketing issues. Three of your books have been on the New York Times bestseller list, and your works have been translated into over 50 languages. You have been chairman and CEO of three international research and consulting firms. You first gained international recognition in the 1970s when you led the largest ever research study of successful sale selling and sales effectiveness. This massive project, supported by major multinationals, including Xerox and IBM, involved a, re a research team of 30 people who studied 35,000 sales calls in over 20 countries. The research took 12 years. From the results of these studies, you published the classic spin selling and major account sales strategy. And you are the author of over 50 articles on marketing, selling, and channel strategy. Your sales training has won you the Instructional Systems Association Lifetime Award for Innovation and in Training and Instruction. You've worked closely with many leading sales forces such as AT&T, Citicorp, IBM, Motorola, Siemens, and Xerox. And you've worked with senior partners in some of the world's most successful professional service organizations, including McKinsey. You are a sought-after conference speaker who receives top reviews from participants for your capacity to take complex issues and make them accessible and interesting. Use a combination of humor, passion, and group interaction to stimulate and challenge your audiences. More than half of the Fortune 500 train their salespeople using sales methods der derived from your research. And you are a visiting professor to several universities in Europe and the U.S. You have a number of awards, which I will include at the end of the video to not cover them right here today. But here we are today at your writing cabin in Northern Virginia, where you are not only working on improving sales performance, but you write poetry and science fiction and play medieval musical instruments. As further background, you were born in England and spent some of your early years in Borneo. Let's start with that. What brought you to Borneo? Uh, my father was working out there setting up schools. Um, and so it, it very early on in my life put me into a very, very different culture. And uh, I was there intermittently into my teenage years. And it was a big influence. Um, I, I think in a way that would appear negative, it actually sort of works. That is, I really didn't understand Western cultures very well. And I think a lot of my research emphasis was an attempt to understand the, the kinds of interactions which I wasn't very good at. And another way of saying it is, I, I wasn't good at chatting up girls. And I needed to know a lot more about how to do that kind of thing. And I, I might not have ever felt the need for it if I'd been brought up stably within a single culture. Well, thank you. So into your teen years, then you went back to England or where'd you go from there? Yeah, I was in Borneo. Um, I didn't have much in the way of qualifications and I was advised by a great, great anthropologist, sociologist, a man called Tom Harrison. If, if you ever have a spare moment, um, read his biography. There's a book called The Most Offending Soul Alive, which is a biography of this man who incidentally invented market research. Market research came out of a company that he formed um, in the Second World War. But he was a, a bit of a pirate, a strange, active, charismatic man, and I was complaining to him that I was living at that time in a little um, Dayak village on the edge of a river. And there was, of course, nothing like running water, no roads, um, no electricity. It was, it was a fairly Stone Age visit. And I was complaining to him, Tom, the, the young guys are going down into the town and 
earning money and buying outboard motors and putting them on their canoes and they're coming back with transistor radios and, and this is destroying our village life. Um, how do I stop it? He says, Neil, how old are you? I said, uh, 17 and a half. He said, 17 and a half and you're a conservative, a reactionary in this society trying to stop something you'll never stop. So by the time you're 25, you'll be old and bitter. He said, take my advice, get out. Get out now, go back to England, get yourself some education. I was shocked, because I thought he embodied all the values of preserving the old way. But I sort of realised he was right. And so what I did was I went back and I applied to all the universities I could find in Britain. And most of them wrote, uh, if they wrote at all, a piss-off letter, don't, don't darken our doors. <laughs> but one of them, Sheffield, said, you sound interesting. We'll take you. Now, what I didn't know was that the psychology department of that university, under Professor Harry Kay, had been given a grant by the British government to study non-traditional entrants. People would not have a hope of getting into a university but had something unusual in their backgrounds. Because at that time, university education in Britain was very elitist. I got my degree, and I didn't have to give a cent in terms of fees. And not only that, I was given a grant to live on. So everything was paid for. The downside was only about 6% of people were ever accepted. And so it was a highly competitive thing to get in. And I wouldn't have got in. But just through this back door, because I had this unusual background, I got into Sheffield University Psychology Department. And boy, it was fascinating. That's why I did a lot of my early research. Um, my first ever research publication was about smell, of all things. You know, we know how vision works. Vision, we have three primary receptors, and there's a spectrum of light, and using these colour receptors we can perceive colour and uh, we know all about the ear. Again, a spectrum of sound and we hear high frequencies or low frequencies through the cochlear mechanism in, in, uh, in our ear. We understand those senses. At that time, no one had a clue about smell. Why does something smell? Is smell a spectrum? We can't find it if it is. What is it? How does it work? And um, a uh, uh, a fairly well-known um, scientist called Amor had, had written a, a, a very enterprising theory of smell and, and that was called the a stereochemical theory. He said smell works because these little pits in your nose which, which are shaped so that the molecule fits in so anything that's going to smell has to fit into one of those pits and it's just like you know a colour has spectral things on the three primary receptors in the eye. And it, I thought, hey, this sounds good, this sounds good, I, I, I like this theory. But then he made a fatal mistake. He said, and to support this theory, look at the phenomenon called extinction. Now, extinction is, when you first come into a kitchen, you can smell the cooking smells. When you've been there two minutes, you can't smell them. It's not that you've forgotten them. In that sense, smell isn't like any other sense. So, for example, behind me I can hear a clock ticking right now. I wasn't aware of it, but when I stop and listen, I can hear it. But I can Oh, it's even doing a little strike for us on time. <laughs> now, we can't do that with smell. And so he said the reason why you can't do that is if there's a concentrated smell, all the pits in your nose fill up and there's no room for further stimulation. So this was to support a theory of smell. I thought, wait a bit, what he's saying is, if a smell is strong, it should extinguish quicker than if it's a weak smell. And that doesn't make sense to me. And so I started doing some experiments. I'd stick test tubes under other students' noses and say, tell me when you can no longer smell this. I'd time it. And then I'd take weaker solutions, or stronger solutions. I'd 
tested out. And indeed, stronger solutions stick with you longer, which rather knocked his theory. And I published a little tiny thing on that. And um, so that's where I started my research. And I, I, I moved from there to doing other pieces of research. I did um, some research on comic books. And that got me interested in communication. What's the definition of a comic book? It's interesting. It's not like a, an illustrated book. Because in a comic book, neither the pictures nor the words are a sufficient communication in themselves. I had some Superman comics translated into Mandarin, Mandarin versions. And when you show that to Westerners, they can't work out what the storyline is because they haven't got the words. But when you put just the words of the Superman comic in English together without the pictures, you can sort of largely do it, but it's really hard. So I defined a comic book as a, an integrated communication in pictures and words where neither the pictures nor the words are sufficient by themselves. And my theory was, hey, if that's true, wouldn't that be a great learning tool for helping kids learn to read? I started doing some experiments, and indeed it was, and it worked. Fabulous. I, I got myself a lot of enemies through doing that, <laughs> because at that time teachers looked down on comic books. Ugh, mm -hmm. We don't like these things. And they're, they're, they're very low grade, they're taking children away from real literature, and they should be banned. In fact, they were mostly banned in, in classrooms. So uh, that did, though, leave me with a lot of interest in how people learn. And I suppose that was the beginning of my interest in learning. So after I graduated, I, I moved on to a, a research fellowship with um, the British government, looking at the evaluation of management training. And we were able to very easily assess the knowledge gain of managers when they've been trained. The problem was that wasn't really the issue of management training. Most management training was about these amorphous things like leadership. Now, how do you assess whether people have learned leadership? I don't like the idea of you give them a questionnaire. That's, 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 that's knowledge. How do you tell whether people have a skill? And we didn't know. And I began to develop some tools and techniques for watching people at work interacting with others and just counting how often they use certain behaviours. That was the beginning of the, the school that was in, uh, in Europe called Behaviour Analysis. Behaviour Analysis has another name and another meaning that's come up since in the States, but you know, Behaviour Analysis in Europe started there. And that's why I founded a, a little company called Performance Improvement, way back in 1970, as I recall. So I was in the performance improvement business very, very early. So when I left my fellowship, I began to run a little independent research consulting firm. And, and that's where I, I, I started off in, in performance improvement. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, <clears throat> what led you to Huthwaite then? Well, yes. Um, Huthwaite, uh, isn't that an interesting name? People have great difficulty pronouncing it. Uthert is the way that it's pronounced in oh. Yorkshire. Uthert. Mm -hmm. But it's from the Norse. The north of England was overcome by the Vikings in the 9th, 10th century. Hut in Norse means the same as hut in English. Uh, a little, little tiny house. Thwaite in Norse and in Yorkshire dialect means a clearing in a forest. So Hut Thwaite, which became Huthwaite, was a clearing in a forest. But when I was a, a young researcher, I was looking to buy an apartment in, in the city of Sheffield. And then I saw in a local paper for £8,000, which is about $12,000. This huge country house called Hathwaite Hall, in 20 acres of grounds, 
I thought they'd left off a zero, but I called just in case. No, 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 come and look at it, come and look at it, they said. And, and so I did, and I thought, wow, I've never seen a place like this. So I put in an offer, and they accepted. Now, I should have known from the way they all oh, sighed with relief when I signed that I'd done a terrible thing. <laughs> in those days, if you owned a historic building, and this was ever so historic, it was the first work by one of the major Georgian architects, John Carr. Um, he, he was only being held up by his own preservation orders. And in, if you owned such a building, you were compelled to maintain it or you could be imprisoned. And the previous owner didn't want to be imprisoned and it was in a dreadful state. So I then had to not only um, have this around my neck because I couldn't sell it on, but I, I had to do something. And so I asked my accountant, what should I do? And he said, you know what? You should try and run a business out of the house called Huthwaite Hall. So I thought, I'll set up business. What kind of business? Well, he said, it's very restricted. You can't run any old business out of a historic building. But you can run, for example, think tanks. Ah, I said, or research. Oh, yes, yes, you could run a research company. So I founded Huthwaite Research Group, which ultimately changed its name to Huthwaite, and, and that was the story of that company. Yeah, cool. I remember in 1981 when Bill Wiggenhorn sent me to Huthwaite to work with some of your people back there. You, I think you were in the States already, but uh, they took me to another house and they explained to me the story of where the name of the company had come from, from a house, but I was never sure as to whether it was that house or not, but it was such a congenial atmosphere at that house. I remember when it was came for lunchtime, everybody went into the kitchen and, and started an assembly line to make food for everybody to eat, and it was just something that would so impressed me that later on in my own firm, I had a chance to design a kitchen and that was my model. I wanted people to be able to come together and chat at breaks and at mealtime and all that and just have a very homey feeling to it all. Can you share with us a little bit about uh, where you now live and work? Well, I, I hope that you'll be able to superimpose on me a few shots of the outside of where we are now. We're in my writing cabin, which is two miles downstream on Goose Creek, one of Virginia's scenic rivers, from my house. So in the summer I can canoe to work and I'm here on a horseshoe, rocks up above the river and uh, I can look out my window and I have great views and I see not a single habitation. So it's a, it's a wonderful place for writing and thinking and uh, I, I'm happy as a clam here. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of your work. Uh, I think most people will know about spin selling and your research, the book itself, the training that uh, still goes on, even though you've left Huthway. What are some of the other more interesting things that you've worked on in your career besides uh, sales? Well, I started off looking at the interaction between managers and their subordinates. I moved from there to get very interested in teamwork and created a behavior analysis system was, was called 11 category systems. Um, I've used that pretty pragmatically to, to just get a general view of how people work well together because that's been a, something of an obsession throughout my career. I, I was lucky early on I met some very influential thinkers in the performance improvement field. The first was very old when I met him, a man called Reg Revens. Reg Revens invented a thing in the late 1930s called action learning. He said, you learn it by doing it. You put people on the job. You don't simulate. You make them do it. And then you give them coaching and help. That made a lot of sense to me. And, and Reg made me think about, well, how do you help people? Because one of the things he would always say is you've got to give some feedback to people on their performance. And he was rather late in his life when he 
he, he met me, he said, let me tell you what the big issue is. The big issue is we can't measure these things. So the feedback we give is very anecdotal. You know, you did it this way, but you know, in my experience, it would be much better if you did this. Well, that's like saying, if I were you, which I'm not, I would do this, which you didn't. It, it, it doesn't seem to change performance very much. He said, if only we had showed people something objective. And I was starting to work on those things. So he was a huge influence. And then I spoke at a conference with a, a most amazing, strange, um, peculiar man, Tom Gilbert. Tom Gilbert was the inventor of a thing called Mathetics. He wrote the Journal of Mathetics, which ran to one issue. He was strange and reliable and brilliant. And he really had a poet's grasp of performance and what it meant and why you should measure it. And I was really inspired by him, as was Gary Rumbler, of course, mm -hmm. who. Uh, had that set who actually I think worked quite closely at one time with Tom Gilbert. And that was the beginning, I think, of the current performance improvement movement. He was hugely influential at that. And I just had the good fortune to come across him at a crucial time in my career. So that that was early research that set me up in the performance improvement field. And they were very, very influential people. But from there I realised that the big contribution I could make was studying interpersonal behaviour, looking at interactions. I had a methodology for counting them and correlating them with outcomes. It was then it struck me, the ideal thing to measure was sales. Because sales has an outcome, it has a result, it's a performance with a result. It has rules that are fairly clear. There's usually two people, but best of all, best of all, it's an interaction where money changes hands. And so people will pay to let you study it. And that's how I was able to put together the biggest research project in sales history. And that was the spin model. Mm -hmm. That's a theme that runs through most of your work, this interpersonal communications. Is that pretty much it? Mm -hmm. I work quite a lot in that field because that, that's a kind of core thing and there are so many issues. Nowadays I'm doing different stuff. Um, I've got on the formal side, um, I have a, a, a professorship at um, Sheffield University, my old university, and they have been kind enough to provide me with a team of five PhDs who are mostly psychologists or linguists and we're studying um, interaction in a, a much more rigorous scientific sense that has been studied before. But that's really not my major interest at the moment. If I, I would think, what, what would I like to do that I would really be remembered for? It's this, again, let me tell you a story. I, I, I really like stories. It was 10, 11 years ago. I was a visiting professor at Cincinnati. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I was giving a lecture on, on sales. And in the front row, there's this kid with a device. And he's texting furiously all through my lecture. And OK. I couldn't resist afterwards saying to him, because it was clear he wanted to be seen, what he was doing, he was making a point, I said, did you find my lecture uninteresting? And he said, and I'll always remember this, not uninteresting, unnecessary. Pow! It hit me. Unnecessary. Think about that. What he was saying was, and he then went on to verbalise this, he said, hey look, 
why should I sit and listen to some old guy trying to cram my head full of stuff? If I need to know something, I Google it when I need it. What he was saying is this. For a thousand years since the University of Paris and then Oxford, the business of universities has been to create, codify, teach, test and certify knowledge. Knowledge has been the business of universities. And I suddenly realised that day in Cincinnati, it was coming to an end. Knowledge is a commodity. We have all these universities teaching knowledge. It's a record. They're not the things that make people successful. People can get knowledge anywhere. So the issue for me became, what should universities be teaching? And it was pretty clear to me that what they should be teaching is skills. They should shift a lot of their knowledge teaching into, into important skills. But what kind of skills? Now, here's, here's an interesting thing. The US Army in the 1940s distinguished for the first time between hard skills and soft skills. Hard skills are how to assemble and clean a rifle. Soft skills are how to counsel someone, how to persuade someone. The interactive skills are soft skills. And what the army said was, we know how to teach hard skills. Maybe these soft skills aren't teachable. And when you think about it, there is a problem. You see, universities do teach skills. But they'll often be teaching the hard skills. So they teach uh, medical students to diagnose, to look at an x-ray and say, is there a chance that there's a tumour on this lung? Well, we now, using artificial intelligence, can do that better than 80% of qualified radiologists. And soon it'll be even better. Almost every hard skill becomes outdated by technology very fast. So we can't just say, let's teach the hard, measurable skills, because they've become redundant. For example, 30 years ago, every engineering student, every architecture student, was taught technical drawing. They were taught uh, how to use protractors. Well, that's a skill that's redundant. We don't teach it now because it's automated with CAD-CAM devices. So hard skills, more and more, are moving out as we learn to automate them, and we will learn to automate them. But that leaves the soft skills. Will we ever learn to automate those? And what are the soft skills that a university should be teaching that will help our people's careers, which will help them be successful, will, will adapt them to the world they're going into? And there's a remarkable consensus on this, that there's four classes of skill that come up over and over and over again. And they're called the four C's. And, and the first is critical thinking. Universities should teach critical thinking. They do a lousy job of this. They, they teach it incidentally. Even in the sciences, even in engineering, they don't do a good enough job. There's a lot of pivotal, really interesting papers showing the inadequacies of the way we teach critical thinking. We have to have better ways of teaching critical thinking. Second one, communication. A student should learn to be able to make a decent presentation, to write a plausible report, yeah? to communicate to others and the way they interact with them successfully, convincingly. Yeah? And we don't teach that, or we teach it incidentally. And then the third one is creativity. Can you teach creativity? I think you can. But you don't teach creativity in the normal top-down way that universities teach things. Creativity is not hierarchical. Look, look, at, look at the most creative organisations. They're very horizontal. 
people spark creativity off of each other. Students should be able to spark creativity off of students. It's not a thing taught. It's a thing where you create an environment where it happens. Universities haven't been good at that. They could get better. And finally, and now this is my own research, the fourth of the C's is collaboration. People have to work with each other. And all the research I did on teams, way back in my own doctoral days, that research is suddenly hugely relevant to universities. And so we're, we're studying teamwork in students and how you can teach it cost-effectively, scalably. And that's my big, big piece of work right now. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Is there hope for the universities or is there resistance to all of this? Ah, the forces of darkness are strong and powerful. It's much easier to dust off last year's lectures than to actually teach something fundamental. And take teamwork. Universities could teach teamwork. We know a lot about how to teach teams. And anyone who's in performance improvement knows a lot about these things. But look at the fundamentals. It's highly expensive. Give me $10,000 in a team and I can certainly improve their interactions. But, for example, we've been just finishing this year a study of 500 student teams this year in one university. Could we get 500 skilled facilitators in here? Even if we could afford them, we probably couldn't find them. If we're going to teach teamwork, give people feedback on how they're doing as a team, we have to have much more cost-effective, scalable methods. And, and that's the dilemma today. Is the fulcrum to all of that the team leader, the facilitator? Mm, I, I would distinguish between team leader and facilitator. Okay. Uh, I would say the, the, there was a number of overlapping roles. The team leader within the team, the facilitator who's out of the team but in and interacting with them, uh, the coach, and the, the, the observer who watches them and holds up the mirror and says, here's you. Now, I've been particularly interested in that aspect. Trying to get a, a quantitative picture of what goes on inside a team. Who's doing what? So, and for example, Google did a huge study of teams. One of their key conclusions was that in the most effective teams, participation was very even. Everyone had approximately the same amount of airtime. Well, think about it. You ask people on a team, who did the talking in this session? And their responses are hugely inaccurate, particularly from the person who did most of the talking. It's very easy to count how much time each person has, who says what, and hold that to them. And that feedback changes the way they behave and ultimately has a change in their effectiveness. So that's the kind of work that I'm doing nowadays and having a lot of fun with it. Well, that reminds me so much of the coaching aspect of SPIN. Now, as I recall the story back at Motorola in 81 and 82 when I was there, <clears throat> I believe that you were a proponent of training sales managers to be coaches and not necessarily offering sales training to the sales people. Do I have that wrong or is that the is that the story and then Motorola and they loved it so much but they wanted training for the sales people to lessen that burden on the managers. Well you, you raise a whole bunch of issues. Let me make a speech. Sure. I'm making a speech. <laughs> Yes. I, in, in, my, in my time as a consultant, I've turned around many sales organizations. A sales organization that has good first-line sales management um, capability, I can, I can turn around and improve their performance. Even if it has mediocre salespeople. 
But a sales organization with okay salespeople but not okay first line managers, I can't do a thing. The pivotal job in sales is the first line manager. So one of my great innovations in developing things out of the spin model was let's put our attention to managers ruthlessly. See, I'm pretty ruthless about this. If I had to define the job of a sales manager, I'd say the job of a sales manager is improving the performance of the sales team. Period. Okay, next question. So what what I used to do there was I trained sales managers to watch their people and collect data on what sort of questions they were asking and bring it all in and do a kind of mini research study with us to show which behaviours were turning out to be successful, which ones they were able to change, which were difficult to change. And we just were the coaches of the coaches, the sales managers, the coaches of the salespeople. Of all the important things in the performance improvement field, as of all the tools available to us, I think coaching is the most significant and unfortunately not the most used. Mm -hmm. What about uh, everyone being a coach, everybody being a leader? Should, should we strive to train people on a team to become the temporary leader because it's something that they know about? Or should they all take turns? Or is it best to find the best facilitator, observer, coach? I don't know if you can combine all those because that's a lot to do in, in mm. any kind of a setting. But... Um, I, th I think anyone who's going to give a team feedback needs to be outside the team. Okay. Unless it's very simple feedback. <clears throat> so we've been developing some simple instruments. Uh, le let, me, let me give you a, uh, one example of how a member of the team can give feedback to the rest of the team. One of the things that we know is that in the more effective teams, there's a behavior that's highly used called building. That's taking someone else's idea and improving it, adding to it, adapting it, extending it. And in the most effective teams, there's a lot of building. In the less effective teams, everyone has their own ideas. So you might think it would be good to develop more building. But people don't really have much of a feel for building and how to do it. And some things we, we found seem to work in terms of within team instruments is to give to a team, a team member just a little count off when people come up with an idea of their own, count off when they come up with a development of someone else's idea, and proposing and building, and just look at the ratios of everyone in the team mm -hmm. and feed that back to the team. <clears throat> and do it for the next hour, and then someone else will take it. So you can do that, but a piece of me doesn't like that, because that's interfering with the team's normal work. I, I really like instruments that let it happen, and then afterwards give people just a picture of what's gone on. Mm -hmm. Doing that kind of observation, I, I was trained by you and with, along with Barbara Warburton, you trained the two of us so that we could uh, participate in a pilot session for negotiations training that Motorola uh, uh, attempt uh, did in uh, late 82. And just becoming more aware of this by observing others, I found myself for several years Almost every time I made a statement, I'd say, well, that was giving information in my head, or I'm seeking information now, or I'm summarizing or <laughs> testing understanding, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> is, is becoming, I know that we cannot judge ourselves and what we do. We, we, we'll tell you what we were doing, but it's not accurate. But becoming more self-aware of those kinds of behaviors is that one step to getting people to change their behaviors is becoming much more acutely aware of their own behaviors and, and scoring themselves almost? Yeah. Um, um, I, I, I think there's quite a movement that would suggest that. So, that you, you first become 
aware of it after you've done it, and after a while you become aware of it while you're doing it, and then you become aware that you're going to do it and you decide to do it or not to do it. You know, there's a kind of progression of learning there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fair, yeah, that happens. So people that do the behavior observation of teams of various natures uh, should be outside the team. The team leader, you, you don't, I, what I'm sensing here is you just really don't want to burden them outside of the normal business of the team with taking on this observing and giving objective feedback. And it's best to bring in somebody from outside the team, an independent uh, uh, viewer. Yes, unfortunately it is. Um, though, <clears throat> who knows how long that will be. Now, let me, let me tell you one of the most interesting developments that I have. One of my PhDs in Sheffield is an artificial intelligence person. And she has developed the capacity to analyze verbal behavior in a team using AI methods. Now, at the moment, in a laboratory, we can do it with 80% accuracy, which is compares pretty well with a human observer. Mm -hmm. But we need everyone mic'd up. Um, we need some complicated, um, very, very good sound uh, things because ambient noise destroys this. Mm -hmm. But in the end, we'll be able to do that function using AI rather than having to do it. And you know, technology is entering this field as in all other fields very nicely. So, for instance, I've got an app on my iPad where if I'm watching a team at work, I can watch them at work and send feedback up to the cloud and down to each person's device mm -hmm. so they can see their own behavior and how it compares with the team averages. And we can do that along 15 different behavioral dimensions. So, these, so people can, for example, even now, they can set an objective. I want to do more of this behavior. That building was a behavior mm -hmm. that I gave as an example. I want to do more building behavior. Okay, well, every time you do a build, we can get your phone to buzz vibrate for you. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you, can, you can do that. And incidentally, this kind of instant feedback is, underlies all sorts of gaming-based ways of doing things. One of the great breakthroughs in um, post-kindergarten education right now is the use of the smart board where the teacher, every time uh, one of the kids does something that the teacher considers to be, yes, good, ping, they get a light up on their emotion on their board and they will work to this, positive reinforcement. B.F. Skinner was right after all. But here's the interesting thing. Parents dial in at uh, uh, break times and see how the kids are doing and talk to the kids afterwards about it. Mm -hmm. Your know, technology is lubricating everything. Mm -hmm. This app, this is very, very interesting. Is this app uh, available commercially or will be and training for the uh, observers on this? Our app, we're, we're developing and we'll just make it generally and freely available. It's about two years off being exactly where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. Thank you. That's, that's intriguing. As someone who attempted to listen in on a conversation in a negotiation role-play game, <clears throat> keeping up with it all was darn difficult. Um, and in fact, as I told you before we started the video here, I listened to a couple audio tapes from 1981 that you were speaking to sales management at Motorola and you you talked about these things and um, um, it's just interesting to see this is 39 years later and uh, the promise of technology that's interesting because otherwise scalability is a huge issue you can't yes. you can't get enough certified qualified observers to really go and have it you'd have to really cherry pick where you're going to apply those kinds of people um, rather than try to help everyone, but the technology uh, holds that promise. That's in very interesting. And scalability is what's killed the universities. Mm -hmm. If they can scale the teaching of knowledge, 
I have a lecture with 200 students there, I may as well have a lecture with 400. Mm -hmm. I can just scale it. You try uh, my four C areas. Mm -hmm. You try scaling those. Much harder. Much more challenge. Do you see the promise of AI? Uh, uh, yeah, AI is getting those? there. Mm -hmm. um, AI in sales, for example, is already at a point where it can uh, analyze what's going on in a sales call. And we've already got to the point where after a sales call, it can coach a salesperson saying, the, your customer mentioned this competitor five times and you didn't respond even once. Or, you know, you, you didn't ask any questions about X and yet the customer had raised these issues. And we can already do that. And uh, it's, it's going to be even more interesting the role of artificial intelligence and big data in generating new sales models. You know, the spin model, to create that took us, as you said in your introduction, many years and a lot of dollars. Third, a team of 30 working on it. Well, a little company in California using big data methodologies has been able to collect data on half a million sales calls put it through a big data analysis and come up with a very, very similar model. Mm -hmm. As we accumulate data, the rich will get richer. We'll get better and better performance models. And they'll come from looking at patterns in data. So it's an exciting time. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to say about ethics and uh, artificial intelligence, since that seems to be a, a huge topic, worry, concern, and other people to just dismiss it all as a, not something not to be so worried about? I, I think we should be worried about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be worried though not always for the conventional reasons that we are being somehow infringed on. I, I, I think more worrying than that is the way in which artificial intelligence will enable the powerful to become more powerful. And that means that it can't be good for any society when the disparity of wealth or power or resources grows too great within a society. Mm -hmm. It becomes intrinsically unstable. And the danger of artificial intelligence, to me, is that it is a lubricant to allow that to happen. Thank you. You told us a little bit about your first exposure to HPT, Human Performance Technology. Well, there's many names for that. Evidence-Based Practices for Performance Improvement. And you mentioned Gilbert. Our, uh, for our audience to help point them to <clears throat> people and books and articles from the past, are, are, are there anything, is there anything that stands out from back in the day that you would suggest that people should go look at or read up on? Not a lot. And Gilbert, for example, mm -hmm. um, though hugely influential, uh, wrote very little. You know, that, um, it took me three times to get through his Human Competence book. I, I can yeah. share that with you. And I started recommending to people start at Chapter 10 and read the end of it and then go back to the beginning because I struggled with... It's very uh, dense. It's it very is. dense stuff. But there's, there's a few... Uh, here, here's the interesting thing. It's where you look rather than what you look at. Okay. I find that... The most useful area for me is always when practitioners talk. I, I, I really just like to hear them talking about how they did something. Now, that data is limited and has some problems, but, but at least it, it is a set of interesting insights for me. When it comes to research, Unfortunately, I would have to tell you, I think academic research is mostly bankrupt. It's being done for the aesthetics of journal editors. Yeah? 
I, I have, I had two doctoral students that I was in one university that I'd um, given um, scholarships to, to pursue their doctorates. And I, I met with a group of professors to think about their doctoral areas. And I, one of the professors was saying, well, of course, you have to use structural equation modelling. If you don't use structural equation modelling, you're never going to get into a four-star journal. So it doesn't matter what you do, as long as you use that. The other said, well, the other thing is, you need a stream of, of papers. Now, the hot thing at the moment is, so you could, you could get into that. And these people were trying to look at some, what I thought were some quite interesting issues around performance and how you improve it. But they didn't have a chance. And you know, I found out years later they both got their PhDs and their PhDs were quite incomprehensible to anybody including them. But one of them did use structural equation modelling and so I'm sure she got her PhD in a good journal. You know, that, that to me is really sad. I wish there was better literature. I wish there were better places to go. But in the end, it's often simple common sense of real life practitioners where the, where the genuine wisdom lies. I remember this comment, and I heard it again this morning on my drive here, uh, that uh, you would never look at poor performers, you would only look at the master performers, the top end performers, and compare them against average performers. You had a, you made a philosophical statement about that in the, in the tape here. Can you share with us, because there's, I've, I've had this complaint before, well you should, you should look at the poor performers, and I'd, or, I'd learn from you and applied that and said, no, I really want to talk to master performers and have them tell me about the poor performers. I don't want poor performers to share with me, but I want to have a, I'd like to put together a team of master performers so they can feed off of each other and build off of each other or defend and attack each other. Um, and then get to some point to where they come to consensus on what, what, what does good performance look like and how do they themselves achieve it? And how would you take new people and help them grow into it? But why, why not poor performers? Well, I think when I've studied poor performers, I learn an awful lot about the anatomy of malpractice. You know, how not to do it. But, and here's the problem. It's not just whether you should study poor performers or high performers. We have to study high performers because we don't understand high performance. But we do understand poor performance. If, if I were to ask you, for example, the field of sales, what's the best piece of selling you've ever seen? Chances are you wouldn't even have thought of it as selling. You would have thought of it as a great interaction where you discovered what you needed and wanted. You know? mm -hmm. However, if I ask you about poor performance, you could talk all day because we're acutely aware of bad performance. But good, masterful performance just happens. We don't know how or why. You ask a great concert violinist, what makes them different from the average person sitting in an orchestra chair? They can't tell you. It's really hard. And one of the things that we want to know is not about the poor performer and what they're doing wrong. What we want to know is how to make an average performer better. And so I like studying average against superior. Uh, and to me that's a, just a, a much more rich and useful area to go. If somebody was using your um, behavior analysis tools and they were wanted to go study a particular job and, and they had assembled the targets, the uh, super, the master performers and the average performers, how many observations do you think is safe for them to, where they could stop and begin to draw some conclusions? It depends on the complexity of the performance and the noise of the system. 
in groups, in teams, we're finding that sometimes even a sample of 500 teams isn't yielding us the kind of data that we need for significance. In sales, I have to study 35,000 sales calls. Mm -hmm. It's a very expensive method. However, sometimes you can make a breakthrough on a fairly small sample, providing the question that you're researching is focused enough. So the, the broader your question, the harder it's going to be. So if you say, for example, what do good salespeople do that's different? You won't find that in a sample of 50. But if you were to say, do good salespeople summarize what the customer is saying more than average salespeople? You could probably do that in 100, 150 observations. Mm -hmm. Still, that's quite a lot to... Oh well, yeah, and it's one of the reasons, incidentally, why academics still work on survey techniques, work on tools that are really inadequate, because they have no choice. They're cheap to use, even though the data they give you is, is probably less robust. Uh, this is a standard question I ask in all these interviews. It's really to model for others uh, an elevator speech. So if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? I, I think I would say I, I don't try, I probably have, I'm going to look at notes here because elevator speeches need to be prepared and 30 seconds isn't a long time. So I'd say that what I currently do, I'd say because knowledge is a commodity, universities of the future will focus on skills and my focus is specifically on the skills of teamwork and collaboration. And in order to do my work, I need to create new models of teamwork which are cost-effective, scalable, and linked to high performance as demonstrated by research. So if we were at a party and I said, Neil, what do you do? And that was your 30 second elevator speech at a cocktail party. We'd probably need to go to the bar here because I would have some more follow on questions for you regarding that. <laughs> but, and that's what we're covering uh, here in this video. At the cocktail party, I just <laughs> want to say, I, I want to help my students be more successful. Well, let's go get a drink then. That sounds it should It should lead to something like that anyway. Um, What was your aha moment back in the spin research where you realized that you had something that way back then? Could because you said it would be interesting to focus on sales, there's an interaction, it's measurable, there's a result. When did you feel that, aha, you've got that pattern figured out, uh, the short cycle sales versus the long cycle sales is, yeah. a, is also another aspect of all of that? Yeah, initially I persuaded ironically, given that the, the outcome of this research has been more applied in the United States than anywhere else in the world, I persuade both IBM and Xerox that Europeans didn't respond well to American sales models. At that, that point, the standard sales models were sort of pressure, high closing, techniques. Always be closing. And yeah. It, it was... It was a, a very simplified thing, which largely considered the customer as the enemy. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, people like, uh, I think it was Philip Land, a book called Compelling Selling, uh, were saying things like, I don't let the customer speak, because when customers talk, they raise doubts in their own minds. So the moment the customer tries to talk, give him your pitch. It was always him in those days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that didn't seem to ring true to me. And the methods that Xerox was using had come from 
the States, PSS 1 in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I said, give me some research funds to see if they work in Europe. And what we expected was, no, they probably wouldn't work. And they didn't. But then we found something curious. But they seemed to sort of work when people were selling very small things, like a, an extra thing of toner or a ream of paper. Or, mm -hmm. But they didn't work when they were selling these big machines. And that was the aha moment. Big sales are different from small sales. Aha. An interesting side note to that is that I had heard back then in the early 80s that PSS 1 or 2 or 3, I forget which number it was, professional selling skills, that the people that were selling that program were using your model, which was different than the sales skills themselves. Yeah. But eventually they, uh, uh, I guess, adapted, adopted your models inside of the yeah. PSS. Yeah, well, we, we, we trained them to sell PSS mm -hmm. using models that we created, which were very different. But then we had a dilemma. See, they had a marketplace. They had a following. And, and it wasn't easy for them to just decide, okay, we like a different model. Let's switch it out. It yeah. took a lot of years to evolve that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You and many other sales thought leaders have been preaching about consultative, buyer-centric, value-driven, outcome-oriented sales methodologies for over 50 years now. In your view, why haven't the majority of sales organizations adopted these methods, or have they? I think they have. Yes. It, it's just they haven't necessarily adopted them terribly well. Because we, we live in an age where, although we should know a lot better, the idea of a magic bullet mm -hmm. is, is still a wonderful idea. And, you know, Unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of training companies out there which will say, okay, you know, in three hours we'll transform you, your selling skills, your negotiating skills, your coaching skills, your whatever it is, and we'll give you this as well. And don't answer yet because you also get a free pair of chopsticks. <laughs> there, there's that kind of, of, dare I call it snake oil selling, mm -hmm. still survives, and it survives because... We all want an easy answer. Even though, as Michael Kamey said many years ago, you know, to, to every complex problem there is a simple answer, and it is wrong. Mm -hmm. and we know that, but we still want the simple answer. So I think the impediment is, yes, there's more than adequate proof that we know how to greatly improve performance if you put in the effort, if you put in the hard work, if you add the coaching and reinforcement. Skills need continual practice. We have to recognize it. So, yeah, we can develop these consultative selling skills, and we do. Some organizations mm -hmm. do recognize that. They're mostly organizations where the manager his first line manager is very much dedicated to the performance improvement of the team. And, and yes, there's spectacularly effective things. But unfortunately, the way we organize ourselves doesn't encourage that. For one thing, the, the short term orientation mm -hmm. of companies. Another thing is the sales training position is a position that people cycle through on mm. their way to something greater. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that happens is when people come into that, they, uh, they change everything that the last guy did. They try and do something different to make their name. Uh, and one of the things we know about developing consultative skills is it probably doesn't matter what model you use, whether it's the spin model or a similar model. I'm not saying that there's one great model. What I am saying is there is one great approach, and that is practice and feedback. Practice and feedback. Practice and feedback. Will people get promoted if they say that? Or are they more likely to? Luther saying, well, we have this wonderful new magic. It's, it's called 
uh, neuroscience selling and or, <laughs> or whatever. And, <clears throat> and he, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it appears. And the short term fix is not the consultative sale. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's what we have to focus on. I recall from a, uh, a video that I posted on YouTube, we talked about this just a few minutes ago, uh, before we started recording this, of a one-day workshop you gave at Motorola's Training and Education Center back in June of 1981, and it was your 10 design criteria, how to improve training designs, and one of the points that you made there is to do a lot less to try to cover less ground and to focus on practice with feedback. And it seems, it's been amazing to me that, that I see so much training that is SANS practice and feedback. We just tell them, we might show them, and then we move on to the next topic. And we don't ever, and we expect that to take. And, uh, it's just amazing that people don't do that. So I'm very happy that you, you you made that comment about practice and feedback and objective feedback, not just an anecdotal feedback. Uh, part, by the way, I wanted to mention that uh, Mike Kunkel, a sales enablement guy who is very much a, a performance oriented and a big fan of yours, uh, helped me with some of these questions here um, because this, this is in particular his question. But according to CSO Insights, quota attainment has been trending down for seven straight years. What are most sales leaders getting right and wrong today, especially what's holding them back from achieving higher levels of performance with their sales force? And I think I know the answer already, and we've kind of covered that ground already, but... Yeah, several things. One is sales has changed fundamentally. Sales has divided almost dichotomously into the consultative sale which is defined as a sale where the customer doesn't know the answer and wants help and advice, to the transactional sale where the customer knows the answer before they meet a salesperson. All they want is fulfillment, convenience, right price. Now, those are two different sales. Still in most sales forces, salespeople have both types of customers. Hmm. In the more successful sales forces, the transactional has already migrated to marketing because marketing has all the tools for the transactional sale. The transactional sale, what do you need to be successful? You need a great brand because you're not, you can't afford to send salespeople out because the customer is buying just on price. The customer already knows the answer, doesn't have to be educated. So you need great advertising, you need a good brand, you need a fabulous website. Sounds like marketing has those tools, not sales. Mm -hmm. So marketing in more and more companies is taking over the transactional sales and being measured on it, having quotas. Mm -hmm. Now one of the things you find is, and this I think is a bit of an artifact of his, his model, yes, there's been a fall off quota-wise in the consultative sale. But a big piece of that has been there's been a huge increase matching it in the transactional business but that's moved out of sales more and more. It lies within marketing. So what's happened is in, we have in the consultative business fewer, bigger opportunities and quota setting hasn't entirely caught up with that. But it's happening. So I don't believe that there's been much of a shift there. Okay, thank you. I'm looking at my question here to make sure it's not totally redundant with what we've covered. My question is, what's the biggest challenge in getting results with sales training? And how can sales, sales enablement and sales training leaders do differently to get better results? Is it really ensuring that there's adequate practice of feedback, both in the sales training environment and then continued with coaching? Yeah. The, the, the. Sales training is not an event, it, it's a, an integral process with, with selling. So I think that's the crucial thing. 
Do you have any uh, thoughts to share about the evolving sales technology, including artificial intelligence and machine learning, and how that might impact the sales profession? You mentioned marketing. Marketing has these kinds of tools. Does sales have them, or are they in need of tools that are more specific to th their function? I think we're seeing prompting tools happening more and more. I'm not familiar with that. What's a, prompting tool? A prompting tool is something which nudges the salesperson to ask certain questions ah. or to follow things. And to do this in real time so the salesperson is taking notes on their iPad and op pops, ask this, you, you should look at this, mm -hmm. using AI driven methods. And that's turning to be fairly successful. But there's an even more fundamental question that I'd like to end this interview with on, on the sales side. And that's this, will the time come when artificial intelligence will do the selling? We won't have salespeople in that normal sense. And, and I see this, uh, remembering something that happened 20 plus years ago. Howarth, the furniture manufacturer, um, found that when they sold their um, office furniture suite, they, they had some six million possible combinations to, to assemble. And salespeople were selling, on average, 40 of those six million combinations. Mm -hmm. you know, because you can't remember six million combinations. So they produced a configurator on disk. And this configurator would allow a salesperson to sit with the customer and say, uh, well, suppose we lower these partitions like this. Suppose we change that colour. Is this better than this? And allow them to play and show the customer what it would look like. And wow, it was a great success. Now, that was a sales tool, a sales enablement tool, I think. What happened? The smart customer said, fabulous. Give us the configurator. Don't send us the salesperson. I wonder whether in this day and age AI is going to make much more of that happen. Mm -hmm. That's worrisome. <laughs> because what do we do with all the people that <clears throat> are no longer employed? Anyway, that may get into politics, so we don't need to go there. So let me wrap up our interview here with three final questions. Or the, what guidance would you have for people stepping into the sales role today? What should they focus on and how should they approach that? So I'm an individual salesperson. I'm looking out for myself. Yes, I should be a team player, but what should I focus on to help me be better at my job? I think two things I pick out. One is you've got to be curious. You've got to be interested in the business of your customers. So really understanding your customers better than the customers understand themselves is crucial. Second thing, a little more unusual. It used to be, in the days we did the spin research, that customers valued salespeople who helped them solve their problems. When we looked at this more recently, we found there's been a shift. Customers are particularly influenced by salespeople who help them think about future problems. I, I interviewed one customer here, a buyer, and he said it very well. He said, look, if I fall into a pit, there's 50 salespeople who can sell me a ladder to help me get out. There's only one in 50 who can prevent me falling into the pit, and that's the guy I want to talk to. Mm -hmm. So where would, uh, continuing with that first set of questions, um, where does a new person then go to learn, how do they go learning about their customer, and do they have to look at the marketplace that customer's in, and all the challenges, and all the various stakeholders, regulators, and their own customers, and suppliers, and... Yes, is the answer. Mm -hmm. We have to be good at information. Um, 
I hear salespeople complain the customer knows everything about us and our competitors. They go online and mm -hmm. when we appear, they, they... I say, but that tool cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. You can find much more about your customer and their issues and what's happening. And you must. The seat of the pants selling is dead. That kind of suggests that uh, salespeople really need to not cover too broad a set of industries and need to be, you know, know who their primary customers are and so they can steep themselves in, in gaining insight into what their challenges are to, to sit, stand in their shoes. Well, one of the reasons why industry segmentation in sales forces has proved so successful is it's much faster learning for salespeople. Mm -hmm. So you're right. All right, it's the same question. What guidance would you share for people stepping into sales enablement or sales training roles in terms of uh, their focus and approach? What, what do they need to do to help improve themselves? If you're a good salesperson and we didn't make you the sales manager, we made you the sales trainer so you could teach everybody to be like you, what, what <laughs> which may or may not work, um, what, what should the person entering into sales training be thinking about? I think understanding that you are in a long-term commitment to improving performance, that you don't do sales training to people. You enable them to perform better by providing them with a wide spectrum of things, useful tools. Sometimes tools that are just simple, lovely simple. And now it is. Let, 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 me, let me give an example of one. Um, one of the things which we teach people is the job of the salesperson is to create customer value. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we preach that in our sales training. Now, what's a tool that will enable a manager to encourage their people to create customer value? We don't think of that. But, for example, if a customer perceives value in a sales call, they'll be really pleased with the sales call, and hypothetically, they might even pay for the sales call if it was that good. So if I'm a sales manager and I have one of my salespeople going out next week on a really important call, I can coach them with a little analogy tool. I can call them and say, John, why would the customer write you a check for the call that you're going to make next week? Tell me why. Simple. But boy, it focuses people on value. And you know if they haven't got an answer, they're going to go in there and pitch product, mm -hmm. and they're going to fail. <clears throat> this final question is, in general, what should those who are tasked with sales performance and improvement be focused on? So I'm thinking of people who are on the staff reporting to the top salesperson, uh, some senior executive who's looking at their sales methodology, the process, their methods, the tools that they use. Um, how do they find the levers to pull to improve performance by greasing all the skids? Yeah. Well, it's certainly not a unidimensional thing. So, you know, having a variety of tools is um, probably better than pinning all your faith on one. But at the same time, I, I think there'll be a couple of principles that people find very, very useful. One is the first line manager is pivotal in any sales system. If you can help your first line managers do better, you are doing more than ever you could do at any other level of the sales organization. That would be the first thing. Second thing I'd suggest is your best tool is coaching. Now coaching doesn't have to be done by Friday and so it's always put off till next week. We have to make coaching have an urgency. And so your overriding question is how do you help your salespeople want and demand coaching? How do you help sales managers actually do it? How do you give them tools to enable that to happen? If you could do those things, you could have a huge impact. 
What implications are there for the distributed workforce where coaches don't see their salespeople, but perhaps at the uh, some quarterly meeting maybe, or at the annual sales event, and we're, we're doing these things through digital technology, and um, how can I observe as a coach, as a sales manager, my people, when I can't, when, when my people are so spread out, are there any insights that you have? With, with yes, you, you're forced to focus on planning rather than execution. So, so planning the sales call? Yeah, so for example, that question of mine, uh, why would the customer write us a check for mm -hmm. this call? A sales manager can do that very easily remotely. It's those sorts of tools. But the other thing is this, how can you run a high-level sales business unless you have people there in the call? It's rare nowadays in significant selling to have a single individual in the call. Mm -hmm. If you've got a second individual, you have to start peer coaching tools. If you are an individual with a manager, then you have a coaching situation that can work. That's interesting. If, uh, if we're doing team sales, could there be the <clears throat> appendage to the sales team, the observer who's going to give feedback to everybody but goes along on the call and isn't really there to, to determine their needs and to uh, um, determine the right fit of a, of a solution, but is simply there to take observations? Is that a viable approach? I think it's viable. It may be rather heavy-handed. Um, because we're not, uh, my business is research, mm -hmm. so I need that to do research. If I'm looking at coaching, it, it may be some rather simpler ways of doing it, but yeah, if you've got multiple people on the call, you've also got some free attention, mm -hmm. some of which should be focused on performance improvement. And isn't that what a coach does when they go on the sales call? I think I've, I remember you saying that the coach shouldn't jump in and save the sale. They should hold back and use it as for a teaching moment right after to provide feedback to begin to shape the behaviors for the next call. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, you're on a loser. There's the sales manager who intervenes will almost certainly intervene if they're going to save the call before the salesperson realizes they're going wrong. Mm -hmm. So the salesperson will say afterwards, well, I could have done that. But if the sales manager waits until someone's going to get into real trouble, then the sales manager probably won't save the call and will have no credibility in the coaching. Best keep right out of it. Mm -hmm. right. Great. Uh, Neil Rackham, thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights and wisdom with us. Are, uh, Anything else that we didn't cover that we should have? Oh, I think we've been pretty comprehensive. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Thank you so much.